Hi, Misha here. And I've been covering World War II bombers. And now it's time to kind of get to the grand slam of them all from that war. The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. And uh, the model I'll be using is from Air Force One. Our previous models have all been 172 scale die cast. Well, no one does a B-29 in that. So this is a 144 scale die cast. And this plane is named Raisin Hell from Korea when it was used, but it was also made in 1944, and uh, it's haunted, which actually is going to lead into one of our conspiracy videos, so look for that. <laughs> A model bomber tie-in to conspiracy ghost theory. I don't know when I'll have time to do that, but I think it'll be a neat crossover. And this is probably going to be a longer video, because there's a lot to be said about the B-29. Really as early as 1938, Boeing was starting work on an upgrade, an improvement to their B-17 Flying Fortress. A couple of the early things. They wanted to have a plane with a pressurized fuselage. They also wanted to introduce a modern so-called tricycle type landing gear system. And they wanted better range and payload. A lot of this was driven by the U.S. Army Air Corps' need for a bomber for the Pacific. Early on, it was recognized that the B-17, while perfectly good for Europe, really wouldn't have the range to operate in the Pacific. And if you check out my B-17 video, you'll notice that not very many B-17s operated in that theater for a relatively brief period of time early on in the war. They were very quickly replaced by other planes such as the B-25, B-24, A-20, and A-26. And of course the B-29. Also in 1939 the Nazi threat was looming and war began. So, late that year, in December, the Army Air Corps put out specs for a new heavy strategic bomber. They wanted it to be able to carry up to 20,000 pounds. They wanted it to be able to fly 400 miles per hour and have a range of at least 2,600 miles Initially, several companies were interested. You had Consolidated, Lockheed, and Douglas. And of course, Boeing submitted their design, which they had been working on for a couple of years, as the XB-29. Well, quickly, Lockheed and Douglas bowed out, leaving Consolidated and Boeing. And Boeing was picked as the prime candidate and awarded a contract for two prototypes and Consolidated was kind of kept on as the backup which was a common practice back then that's actually how the B-17 entered into service because originally it was kind of the backup or second choice after the B-18 Bolo and in May of 1941, Boeing was given a contract for a total of 264, 250 standard and 14 kind of pre-production XB-29s. 
an order which was quickly updated to 500 after Pearl Harbor. So production began. This was a hugely expensive, complex, massive undertaking. Boeing required four plants to manufacture the plane, each plant specializing in a certain aspect, and thousands of subcontractors. The U.S. government spent more money on the B-29 than it did in the whole Manhattan Project. This plane was revolutionary for its day and time. The fuselage was indeed fully pressurized. It had a pressurized front and rear section with the Bombay unpressurized and then kind of a hamster gerbil style tunnel connecting the two parts for crew to go between. It had a quite unique looking a la Millennium Falcon cockpit. It had a crew of 11 pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, radar operator, bombardier, and it had four gunners, but the way the gunners were set up was a very different. You had a total of four turrets plus a tail gun, and you had anywhere from 10 to 12 Browning 50 caliber machine guns, but the turrets were remote controlled and they were analog computer assisted to help correct aiming so on and so forth so you only needed a couple of people to manage all the guns so you basically had one guy who's in kind of in charge of directing a couple other guys with the guns you also had observation ports on the sides and you had of course the tail gun and tail gunner this plane was massive. It was just under 100 feet long. Had a wingspan of over 140 feet. Compare that to the B-17, which had, was a little under 75 feet long. and had a wingspan of just over 100 feet. They didn't quite reach the speed they were hoping for. This could get up to about 360 miles per hour. But that was a significant improvement over the B-17, and this could cruise at about 300 miles per hour. And really its ceiling depended on its bomb load. It could definitely get up past 30,000 feet, though. And that's pretty much where it operated. It could carry anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 pounds in bombs, depending on the range. If light loaded, 5,000, it could go 3,200 3, miles. If heavy loaded, its range would be limited to 2,000 or less. Still very significant and much better than what came before. The engines too were very advanced for their day and time and also very problematic. In 1943 they started to manufacture the plane the first prototype had flown September 21st, 1942, unarmed, and then the second prototype flew with the turret system installed in December of that year, but then unfortunately the second prototype crashed in February, killing uh, about a dozen people. So quite tragic, but you know, the needs of war. They were having so many revisions to the design and so many updates and things that it's quite famous that they were pretty much making these. They were leaving the factory and then immediately going to depots to be upgraded and retrofitted. And uh, production was very low. Out of 100 aircraft that the military had in the end of 1943, only 15 were considered airworthy. And that led into what's called the Battle of Kansas in the spring of 1944, where basically there was a bunch of shake-up, and they, they got the problems sorted out, and within just a couple of months, they had 150 airworthy B-29s ready to go. So by early 1944, most of the problems had been sorted out. I'm not going to say every one, but most had been sorted out, and uh, 
yeah, we were we were good to go. Originally, this was going to operate in the European theater. The idea was Egypt. They were going to station these in Egypt and fly them over occupied Europe. And in fact, the Hobo Queen was sent on a publicity tour throughout the UK as part of a disinformation program to essentially scare the shit out of the Germans that this was about to be over their skies. But it was all a ruse. The B-29 operated exclusively in the Pacific during World War II. And that's where it really cut its teeth and became known. This model from Air Force One is pretty neat considering the smaller scale. The turrets do rotate. It does have up-down landing gear. It does have glass for the cockpit. Pretty neat considering the cost of these. And the very interesting history of uh, raising hell herself. But we're just getting into the story. So let's move on to the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. Alright, let's set old box, excuse me, old raising hell aside for a minute and move on to boxcar. Which was part of the Silver Plate series. And you know where this is going. Well, the B-29 was originally designed primarily to operate in the Pacific Theater. So it only made sense that that would be where it would have its combat debut. In late 43, early 44, President Roosevelt essentially mandated that the first available B-29 squadrons go to the Pacific. This was initially called Operation Matterhorn. In it, bases for the B-29s would be made available, created in India and China, which was extremely difficult because of supply lines, threat of the Japanese, and having to fly over the hump as it were, into India. But they made it happen. The first B-29s arrived in China earlier that year and in India by April of 1944 and began preparing. Their first kind of test mission happened on June 5th and was over occupied Thailand. Around 98 were launched, although the number varies from source to source. And while none were lost to enemy fire on that mission, also their bombs really didn't hit the target much and didn't do a lot of damage. But again, this was an early test flight. Then, on June 15th, just, of course, a week and a half later, these planes would fly at the extreme edge of their operational range and bomb the Japanese home islands at Tokyo. Once more, the mini bombs would miss their target, only a couple actually hitting it. But, this would be the first bombing raid over the Japanese home islands since... Doolittle's famous raid back in April of 1942, which I do mention in some detail in my B-25 Mitchell video. So, it's really taking the war to the Japanese again. Then, in the summer of that year, primarily from July to August, American troops, Marines, and so on, would take the islands of the Marianas, Tinian, Saipan, and Guam. And this was a strategic move to open up five 
airfields for the B-29s. That's why they mostly took those islands. And this was important because it made Tokyo well within the range of the B-29. Only about 1,500 miles. Which meant it would be easier, safer, consume less fuel, and the planes could carry more of a payload. And so, really, even before the islands were secure, the Engineer Corps, often un overlooked and undersung branch of the military in World War II, but vitally important, started work on these airfields, and the, they were ready by October. The first B-29s arrived in the Marianas, and by November, they started to fly missions from these new air bases, including raids over Tokyo. Throughout that whole year, they continued to fly missions from the Indian and Chinese bases. In fact, that same November, the largest single bombing raid of the war was conducted over Bangkok. And then after the new year, bases would be shut down. First, the Chinese bases would fly their final missions in January of 1945 with the squadrons being transferred to the new airfields in the Marianas. And then the Indian bases would be shut down in March. The nice thing about the Marianas Islands, they could be resupplied, including fuel and bombs, via ship, because by this point, America pretty much ruled the waves in the Pacific. It's also worth pointing out that the B-29's primary defense was not its multiple 50 caliber machine guns. It was its high altitude flying and speed. By this point, most Japanese Zeros, well, they were pretty few and far between to begin with, but they couldn't get up past 30,000 feet and pursue a plane able to go 360 miles an hour. Not in time to intercept. Also, Japanese anti-aircraft artillery did not have proximity fuses, so they weren't terribly vulnerable. However, starting in February of 1945, some B-29s were operated at night on carpet bombing missions lower altitude nighttime missions using incendiary because a lot of Japanese cities and dwellings were made of wood or bamboo other flammable materials so dropping incendiary ordnance was hugely impactful that began in February on March 9th of that year the most destructive single raid of the war happened over Tokyo with incendiary bombs. It did more damage and killed more people than the later nuclear drops. Hugely devastating and, and terrible with major loss of civilian life. Then in April B-29 started dropping mines into Japanese ports and harbors and shipping lanes. Mining it to the end result, by May-June of that year, Japanese industry had nearly come to a complete standstill. Most factories were bombed into rubble. Many workers were injured or killed with their homes in disarray. And they couldn't even ship stuff. And that's the thing about having an island nation. Even if you make things on this island, you have to get them to the other island. Well, if your lanes and ports are mined and there was a, a blockade too, it was getting supplies. Um, for example, anyone who knows my gun collecting, I find Japanese Arasaka is very interesting. You can get a 1945 Arasaka, even today in 2019, brand new, essentially unfired, because they would make these rifles or pistols, and then crate them up and have no way to get them to the soldiers. They just they couldn't get them away from the factories, essentially. 
and the B-29 led the way. Each of the airfields on the Marianas operated 180 planes, meaning that we had about 550 flying routine bombing raids, daytime strategic bombing, nighttime incendiary bombing being hugely impactful. But the worst, or the most impactful, of course, was very much yet to come. Okay. This is Fat Man. Well, a model of. This was the second atomic weapon to be dropped on the nation of Japan and what essentially effectively ended World War II. There were still some conventional bombing raids that happened afterwards, but this did it. This is a 172 scale die cast model from Air Force One. It is a companion piece that is shipped with this plane. As I said, this is boxcar. This is the so-called silver plate series, which were 65 B-29s selected at the factory to be specially modified to carry and deliver atomic weapons. Essentially what they would do, they would remove turrets in the system that went with them, the computerized system, leaving only the tail gun system. By the way, originally they were going to have two 50 calibers in the tail and one 20 millimeter cannon, but the 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter cannon was very quickly deleted or replaced with a third Browning. As you see, this made the plane very much sleeker, saved quite a bit of weight, allowing them to carry more and or fly further. They also reworked the engines, allowing the props to be reversed, meaning if a plane essentially could you know, reverse, if it was landing and overshooting the field, they could be spun to slow it or reverse it. In fact, that's what saved Boxcar upon its somewhat rough landing and of course other modifications were made but those are the two big ones <clears throat> the bombing raids of course would continue throughout June and July on August 6th B-29 named Enola Gay dropped Little Boy on the city of Hiroshima the first time a nuclear weapon was used and then on August 9th boxcar here would drop the second nuclear weapon Fat Man which was a different design Still nuclear. This would end World War II at the cost of a quarter million lives, most of them civilian. I'm not going to get into the argument if it was justified or not, because that's history. It happened. But I will say. I grew up with a Japanese lady in our community of a small town that married a 
American servicemen after the war and moved and was she was a very active member of our community especially with the youth and she told stories she said in her village they had one automobile most everyone traveled by bicycle and she was close enough when it happened that she could see the flash and she basically said you know we were no threat to, to anyone we were just peasants living our lives Yes, their government got them into an ill-advised war, but unfortunately, governments rarely pay the full price. It's the citizens, and uh, stories like that have stuck with me my entire life. But it definitely was a historic event, and that again was the Silver Plate series. I went with Boxcar over Enola Gay. Air Force One makes both models for a couple of reasons. One, this did end the war. And two, they both come with their nuclear weapons. But um, Fat Man here is 172 scale, so it scales well with my other stuff. Whereas... Little Boy is actually 160 scale, so it doesn't quite scale as well. Well, there we have it. These planes, B-29s, the Silver Plate series would continue in service through the 40s. They were the only planes that America had that could del deliver nuclear weapons, and thankfully they never were called upon to do so again except for a couple of tests. And on a brighter note, after the war, the B-29 was used to drop barrels of food to POW and other prisoner camps and were used to save lives. And they continued this and they continued to transport cargo and fuel and helped rebuild Japan. Also, they helped set many distance records after the war. 1945, 46, 47, they were some of the most long-ranged and had the best endurance of any aircraft in existence at the time. And they would lead, of course, to the C-97 military freighter. So it wasn't all war with this plane. In the end, when production was over in 1946, nearly 4,000 had been built in just over three years. And their service would definitely continue after World War II. So let's get Raisin Hell back out here and wrap up this here video. Alright, we got Raisin Hell back. You know, Boxcar is pretty neat. The fat man bomb will sit on this little pedestal. It's got a little hole in it for it. But the nuclear history and everything, honestly, I like this one better. A little less grim. Also, the turrets are neat. <laughs> How they move. The only bad thing, or I shouldn't say bad, but frustrating thing. The tail gun, very important. You have to plug those tiny little cannons, tiny little machine guns in. It hit it so hard. Um, I basically kind of got them seated and then very gently tapped with a hammer. Once they're in, I think they'll stay. But uh, on both of these, I had to put the tail guns in. The other stuff came pretty, you know, ready to go. <laughs> anyway, uh, production ended, but these are still in service after World War II. In the late 40s, Mostly it was just the silver plates that were still being flown actively. The, the rest of the fleet was um, was essentially kind of put away. In 1950, America would give on loan several B-29s to the UK so they could have a heavy bomber capability. They would call these the Washington B-1s. 
and uh, the Brit the British uh, RAF would return these in 1954 when their own Canberra English Electric Canberra was uh, ready to go, which was a jet bomber. So the Brits would have these as the Washington for a brief time. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't really wait to be invited <laughs> to be offered some. Actually, in 1944-1945, four American B-29s were flown and landed or crashed, in the case of a couple, in eastern Russia and Siberia. At that point, Russia was neutral and the Pacific War. They had not declared war on Japan. They would later, right at the end. But, um, so what happened, Russia would essentially allow the American crew to quote-unquote escape, but they would uh, hang on to the planes, despite American protests. And so they would re reverse engineer. The Tupolev company would uh, carefully deconstruct and re-engineer and come up with the TU-4. At this time, 1945, Russia really didn't have a heavy bomber capability. In fact, their heavy bombers were extremely outdated and pathetic. But this let them leapfrog forward, and in 1947, they unveiled to the world the Tu-4, which looked almost identical to this here B-29. <laughs> they did have a few different measurements, they used slightly different engines, but essentially it was a B-29. Then Korea, 1950, the B-29 fleet started flying daytime strategic bombing missions over Korea. But this didn't last terribly long for a few reasons. For one thing, they were pretty much able to pound North Korea's factories and bridges and all that into rubble quite early on. For another, though, the MiG-15 started to appear, and... Uh, was a modern jet fighter and this is of course a prop plane even if it was advanced in 1944 by 1950 already it was starting to get dated because of the evolution of technology so after nearly 30 B-29s were lost in combat they switched to medium altitude to low altitude nighttime kind of missions again more carpet bombing they also started using these to deliver some of the earliest radio-guided bombs. Taking out things, again, like bridges and other small pinpoint targets. The B-29 would continue to be flown all the way through Korea. Flying the last mission on July 27th, 1953, the last day of the war before the armistice. After that, though, that was pretty much the end of its service. They were kept around for a few more years, officially being retired in a ceremony on June 21st, 1960. And coincidentally, I'm recording this on June 21st, 2019. So the B-29 bomber was officially retired 59 years ago. Now, that said, some of the variants, like the tanker variant and some of the reconnaissance and cargo stuff, were kept in service through the early days of the Vietnam War with the last B-29 derivative being retired from service in 1965 in America. And there you have it. Oh, one funny thing, as newer, better bombers came online, like the B-47, B-40, B-50, B and eventually, of course, B-52, this one went from being a, quote, heavy bomber to a, quote, medium bomber by the standards of the 1950s. So what was big and heavy for the 40s was quickly not so big and heavy by the 50s. Again, technology was progressing very rapidly in this period. It's kind of funny to read about other planes that went into service in uh, 
1938-1940 being considered obsolescent as early as 1942 and things. Again, te technology is just really leaping forward at this point in history. You know, today we wouldn't really consider that. We have planes that take 20 years to uh, come onto service and are still quite modern. But back then, things were a bit different. And that is my tribute and conversation about the B-29 from Boeing, the Super Fortress. And my look at the Air Force One models of Raising Hell, which is your typical B-29 bomber with uh, the remote-controlled turrets. And B-29 boxcar from the Silver Plate series with the Fat Man bomb. Nice models for the money. If someone ever does a 172 scale, that would be pretty awesome. It would be huge, but not gargantuan to the point of absurdity. But 144 is still a lot more detail and room for interest than, say, 1200 or 1350. So, it's not so bad. These models, like most of your Air Force Ones, maybe lack a little bit in detail, but also are made almost entirely of metal. So, that's pretty neat. Any questions or comments? I welcome them below. And if you haven't, you might check out some other model bomber videos. Otherwise, I appreciate it greatly. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.